diverticular disease. A diverticular or an opening from a tubular or scapular organ. So, what we're looking at is If this is your large intestine, okay, and here's the wall of the large intestine, a diverticulum is actually an outpocketing of this. So it would be more like this. So that when food goes through here, some of it may go in the diverticulum. Very similar to what we're saying with appendicitis. And that would cause the same issues over here. But in most cases, when people are going to talk about with diverticular disease, they have hundreds of these over there. And we'll talk about what that is. Okay? So um, that's what a diverticulum is. All right? Um, what happens here, again, if you have a low fiber diet, meaning someone who likes to go to McDonald's all the time, right? You have a lot of fatty foods that you're eating, less fiber, things like roughage and lettuce, things like that. Then what will happen is you will have hard stools. The fat will make things harder, which means that the person is going to strain when they're going to be going to the bathroom, okay? When they do, they're going to increase the intra-abdominal pressure trying to push their stool out. And when you're doing that, if food is, is getting very clogged up in there, and you're trying to put more force to push that out, then this is going to descend, and this is going to start getting weaker, and soon you're going to start seeing it start doing this. Eventually, it's going to be a diverticulum. Right? You're putting more force into there. You're increasing your intra-abdominal pressure which means you're going to weaken the colon wall, and it's going to cause, create these diverticulum. Does that make sense? Can you visualize that? Okay. That's why we want you to have a good diet. Um, <clears throat> um, so to prevent, just have a high fiber diet. Just make sure there's a lot of you know, grains you're eating, and, and um, lettuce, and that kind of thing. All right, so... Um, so here's a diverticulum, right? This kind of area here. Don't get mixed up with the seen a polyp, though. A polyp is a solid piece of tissue that usually extends into the lumen. Okay? Or it doesn't have to go like that. It can be flattened like this. And we'll get into polyps in a moment. But a diverticulum is doing that. Okay? So if you put a scope in here, normally as you put a scope through the colon, it's a nice wall. You don't see anything over here. It's a nice smooth wall. But if a person who's got diverticula, they put a scope in there, and you're going to see these holes here. The holes, if I put a scope in here, I'm going to see a hole right there. I'm not going into here, but that would lead to a diverticula. So here you're going to see one, two, three, four different diverticula. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Here's another picture. They removed part of it. This is where the food would go in, up there. This is the wall of the colon. So you're going to see this little diverticulum over here. You see another one over here. You see it? It should be flatter, like that. Okay? So we have two different diseases with this diverticular disease. One is called diverticulosis. And that's just a condition to have a lot of diverticulum. Okay? Um, more than about 50% of people over 60 years old have diverticulum. Okay? Um, 10 to 25 percent will lead to 10 to 25 percent of these patients actually will lead to diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is going to be inflamed areas, which would be very similar to what we showed you with appendicitis, except a diverticulum is going to be inflamed. Okay. The stig 
sigmoid colon is the most common site for this. So I ask you, if someone has diverticulo uh, diverticulosis um, in their sigmoid colon, are they going to have pain in their right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, or left upper quadrant? Sigmoid colon. Yep, yeah, left lower. Right here. That's your sigmoid. Alright? So you're seeing where this comes in. See, I can ask questions like this. If someone's got lower or right lower quadrant pain, is that going to be most likely appendicitis or diverticulitis? Appendicitis. Appendix is there. If someone has left lower quadrant pain, is that going to be more likely appendicitis, peptic ulcer disease, see I could throw other ones in there, right? Diverticulitis, you see what I mean? I mean more like diverticulitis, right? You should have an idea about this, these quadrants and where things are located, all right? If you look at my first 50 slides, I have that whole quadrant there and what words are in those areas, okay? But 20, 10 to 25 percent of these people will end up having diverticulitis, and they will have the left side of abdominal pain, fever, and again, very similar to appendicitis. Um, it gets infected, they can perforate, cause peritonitis. If it gets so bad, then that bacteria goes in and causes the peritonitis. It can actually go into the bloodstream and cause sepsis, and we got bigger problems. We do what we do here is give them a lot of antibiotics before it perforates. All right. Um, but you might, it depends on how severe it is. If it does perforate, yeah, they've got to do surgery and they have to inspect that area and do whatever they need to do. Okay? Questions on that? Okay. Hemorrhoids. Okay. Hemorrhoids are varicosities that happen in the rectal area, okay, by the anus. Um, Okay? And it's due to, again, increased intra-abdominal pressure. Okay? So people who are constipated, I know you have a mental picture right now of me sitting on the bowl, but if you're getting constipated, you're trying to push down, right? So what you're doing is that you're trying to push down, we call it a basalva maneuver. But what's happening is that you're trying to exhale against a closed glottis, right? You're trying to, because if you keep your glottis open, all the air will come out there. So you're going to close your glottis, you do this all the time, right? And you try to bear down. So the, what happens is you're trying to exhale, the pressure in your thoracic cavity increases because you're trying to exhale and you can't, so then that pressure transfers to your abdominal cavity because there's only two openings that you could actually let out air from your, your GI tract, either your mouth or your anus. So if you can't get out air that way, you're going to get air, air out the other way. So that's where that comes in. All right? You have to, you just, it's, it's kind of virtually impossible to keep your mouth open and move your bowels. You can't, you can't press down. That's why when I tell patients to, to you know, push with a baby coming out, keep your mouth closed and bear down so that you move, like you're moving your bowels. Because you've got to push down there. If you're like, the, only 50% of your air is going out here, and 50% is going out there. You need 100% going down. We call this the Vestalvo maneuver. Okay? So what's happening here is that if you're constipated, you're putting down more pressure there, which means that there's more pressure that's going to happen with the veins down there. All right? When that happens, they're going to get distended, and they can cause these varicosities. Sitting on the bowl for a long period of time can also do this too. Okay? Um, so prevention is to increase your, your fiber in your diet. So you have stool, you, well, you're not going to bear down as much. So you have soft stools. If you're eating a lot of McDonald's, you tend to have more hemorrhoids because you're going to, not you particularly, but you know what I'm saying, uh, that one would have more hemorrhoids because of that. Okay? And you increase your roughing, increase fluid. You get rectal pain, rectal itchiness, rectal bleeding. I'll show you what that is. So you get stool softeners, if the hemorrhoids are so bad that it's going to cause blockage, and I've seen that too, then you might have to get them removed also, okay? So we have two types of hemorrhoids, all right? We have internal hemorrhoids, 
So here's the anus, right? So here's your internal hemorrhoid, and here's an external hemorrhoid. Right? They're both at the anal canal, or anal sphincter. So that's what's happening over here. Now, the external hemorrhoids, because they're going to be a part of the, the skin, it's like right on the cusp, right on the borderline, you have a lot of nerve endings in your, in your skin. You don't have many nerve endings here. So these tend to itch and become painful because part of the skin is a part of this. Okay? These, the internal ones, well, those are ones that don't hurt, but these are the ones that tend to bleed. Because if your stool is very hard and you're trying to push it right through here, you're going to drag this internal hemorrhoid further and you're going to rupture that. And blood will come out. Now, usually if you have, you're, on blood, you know, you're not in any kind of um, blood thinners or anything, it will usually stop by itself. The sphincter will actually close up over there. But it's pretty scary when you see blood in the bottom of your, um, you know, on, on the toilet, on, on top of your stool. That's what this is. So internal hemorrhoids tend to bleed more. The external ones don't tend to bleed, but they are itchy and they are very painful. Okay? All right. All right, questions about, and these are pictures of hemorrhoids. Okay, so um, you can see some of them are pretty bad, okay? You're going to be seeing this when you're working with especially elderly people. Well, I've seen this actually on young people too. So, um, but anyway, that's what that is. All right, so let's talk about colon neoplasia. All right, overview about this. Most of them are benign. That's a good thing, okay? Most of them. But the benign ones are usually precancerous and usually will turn cancerous about 15 years later. So if you see something there, we want to remove it because later on it'll probably turn cancerous. Um, so like I said, many benign growths are precancerous, so early detection is very important. Most colon neoplasms extend into the lumen and can be seen using um, a colonoscopy or x-ray imaging. So, like I said, if this is going to be, where's my, okay. So this is your colon over here. Here's the wall. So we can have a polyp, or part of a cancer, that can go like this. It goes into the lumen. So when we put a scope in here, we see it, and then we can remove it. So, good to say, we can actually see these things, and we can remove them. Okay. 25% of colon cancers, or neoplasms for that matter, are detected with a digital rectal exam and we use it for also screening for occult blood. So what they usually will do is put a finger in the back end, okay? Some stool is on your finger. Now, I'm not talking about fresh blood. I'm talking about microscopic blood that you can't see, but we can detect with um, something called a Guayac card. That's the name of a, I think it's the name of a company. But they check for occult blood. You take the finger and you put it on this card, on a certain part of the card, and then we have a spray that you spray on it. If it changes to a darker color, there's blood in there. You can't see it, but it's microscopic. Okay? And if it doesn't change color, it's fine. Um, so that's what occult blood is. All right? So we check that you know, to see what's going on. All right? Colon cancer, again, is the number two a cause of cancer deaths in America. What's number one? Lung cancer, right? All right. So let's talk about polyps, all right? There's small flesh growths that come out. I just drew one up there. In fact, I drew what I call a pedunculated, um, it has a stalk to it, so a pedunculated uh, uh, polyp. We could also have a polyp that was what we call sessile, and it kind of looks like this. So it doesn't have a stalk to it. And I'll show you pictures of that, okay? They're mostly benign, but some of them are malignant, and like I said, many of the benign ones are precancerous. Okay? Treatment is that we're going to remove the polyp, right? When we do a colonoscopy. So basically, here's a this is a pedunculated polyp. It has a stalk to it. But we can also have polyps where it's going to be sessile, meaning that there's no stalk. We kind of like have to cut into it, remove it that way, or burn it or something. Okay? 
And these are, uh, this is a piece that got removed, and you can see polyps all around here. And that's what the polyps would look like to the naked eye. Okay? Again, here's a pedunculated polyp. Here's a sessile polyp. Okay? We also have these adamantose um, polyps, and these are ones that um, are precancerous. They try to become can malignant in about 15 years or so. 50% occur in the rectal sigmoid colon. So we can actually do a scope in the office called a sigmoidoscopy that will just go up to and include the whole um, sigmoid. Okay? Um, if you want to do the whole thing, that's called a colonoscopy, that's pretty you're going in pretty deep, so with something like that, we'd like to do that in the hospital. But something like this could be done in the office, which is only about 24 inches long, all right? Which sounds long, but the other one is 60 inches long. Eh, it's a little bit different, all right? So they usually are asymptomatic, so bleeding, but that's why we do the early detection with the cult blood, okay? So there is something I want to just mention to you guys over here, because it warrants that, is that we have familial adamantosis, um, polyposis, syndrome, FAP. This is a genetic disease that's auto, autosomal uh, dominant that's rare, but if we see someone, we don't usually see this until about in the, the teens, but we don't, when we, they're bleeding, and then we got to put a, colon, uh, we do a colonoscopy, and we see that there's a lot of polyps there, if there's more than 100, they have this. The problem is if we leave it alone like this, they end up having cancer by 30 years old. So we got to do something, and what we have to do with something like this is just remove the whole colon. You don't need the colon to survive. The colon is just there to make you comfortable. You see, when the food goes into the colon, it sits there for about 18 to 24 hours. It moves very sluggishly because there is, all the water has been absorbed. So it's very dry in that area, so it moves very sluggishly. We've got a lot of mucus glands that will uh, add like lubrication. So what does it do? Well, if we just had the small intestines going to your, your anus, well, you probably wouldn't be able to sit here, listen to me talk, because you would have to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes because you have to let it all out, okay? But if you have the colon there, now the colon is going to make sure that you can uh, drive to work, sit in a classroom, because the stool is going to sit there for 18 to 24 hours. So what I'm saying is the colon is not necessary to survive, it's there to make us comfortable, okay? And in certain situations, we'll talk about a colostomy where they're going to uh, remove part or all the colon, and, but they have a bag over here. And they've got to change it like every eight hours or so, depending on what they've been eating. But I'll show you that in a moment. Okay? So let's talk about colon cancer. Okay? Uh, we really is colon adenocarcinoma, referring that adeno is dealing with the gland aspect of the colon. And this is probably a, a very preventable disease. If people, and like I said before, most cancers are preventable. They really are. If, you're, if you go to your doctor, get the, normal, the, the proper screening test, if you pay attention to what you're eating, that you're not smoking, and you're not getting too much sunlight, you're listening to what's on the news, you know what your family history is, that if your mother had ovarian cancer and your sister had breast cancer, you know you're at risk, so you're going to go for more screening tests. Basically, most of cancers, they're preventable, okay? Um, and colon cancer is not an exception. It, if you go for your regular exams, you probably won't have it. Or if you do have it, you won't die from it because you caught it early. Okay? So that's why we've got to do these, these screening tests. Um, about a third are beyond cure at the time of diagnosis because they didn't do what they were supposed to. You know what I'm saying? They, maybe they didn't go for their colonoscopy every you know, 10 years or so. They didn't do the occult blood or anything like that. Um, symptoms, usually asymptomatic. Um, if there is rectal bleeding, that's usually a late sign by then. Um, they may have abdominal pain if the um, tumor is getting so big and it's obstructing any food going through the lumen of the intestine. Those are, again, uh, pretty late signs. Okay. Um, so we have screening tests. And one of the biggest screening tests we have that actually cuts the... Um, uh, reduces colon cancer deaths by 30% is this fecal occult blood test. 
All right, again, you just put it on a card, and then you uh, put this little spray, not you, but the doctor put a spray. So, and you could do this at home. Some people, like, guys, we have to get our prostate exam. So they're going to be doing the rectal exam anyway. And women, not so often, so if you get embarrassed by it, what they're going to do is say, no problem, but here's the cards. There's three cards. I want you to bring them home, and then there's a popsicle stick, and when you go to the bathroom, take some of the, uh, you know, just tap your, um, you know, tap it onto the stool, and just put it on the card, close the card, and believe it or not, put it in another envelope, and you mail it. So yeah, there's shit in the mail, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so they do do that, and it's just kind of weird because that's okay, but then powder you can't put in the mail. Not that I would do that too, but I'm like, you know, but you're putting bacteria there too, if there's bacteria there, you know. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so it makes it a little bit more convenient. They do it fairly safe way, and you can do it at home too, if something needs. Um, but that does reduce the um, uh, colon cancer deaths by 30%, and it detects about 50% of colon cancer. So this is a pretty important test to do. The thing is also, is that at 50 years old, we also like to do a sigmoidoscopy. A sigmoidoscopy is done every five years with the fetal, um, with the, um, fecal occult blood test. And polyps and cancer is more prevalent in the sigmoid colon. So that's why if they do a sigmoidoscopy, you can actually get where most of them are going to occur. Okay? But you have to do that every, uh, every five years. If you really want to, you can get a colonoscopy done. And that's every 10 years, but this does the whole thing, all 60 inches going over there. All right? So they keep on going, keep on going, we're going to more. We're not going down. Not that far. Okay? But yeah, so it's that important thing. All right? And if you have any risk factors, let's say your brother had colon cancer, or your father did, then they start that at 40 years old. But you should know this thing. All right? Again, patient education. Okay? So again, what you do with the scope, if it's a sigmoidoscopy, it's only going to be 24 inches, and it just goes to the beginning of the sigmoid. All right? This could be done in the office, the doctor's office. Okay? If you want to get the colonoscopy, that's doing the whole thing, and that's 60 inches. Okay? All right? And that's what we do with that. All right? And you usually even have, uh, at the end of it, they usually will have some instruments so they could, uh, they have a lot of lights there, of course, but they can remove things too. They put a lot of gas in here so it kind of blows up the area so it can see better. As much as people always talk about colonoscopies and sigmoidoscopies, like, oh my God, I don't want to do that. I'll be honest with you, okay? I, I had a couple of these in, in my past, okay? They're, I don't, they're not enjoyable, but they're not anything that, to be bad, feel bad about. What you should feel like you don't want to do is the prep. <laughs> this you just forget about. Now it was nice because I did the colon, they had the colonoscopy, and they don't put you to sleep with that. They kind of put you in a drogginess. So they were showing it on the screen, and I was just watching the whole. I couldn't eat popcorn or anything, but I was watching it. It was nice. It was like a really interesting thing as they're doing that, and I'm watching the whole thing. But the prep is what you should be more concerned about because the day before, you and that toilet bowl is going to be your best friend. All right? Uh, I remember it's usually between 5 and 10 o'clock, which was worse for me. And every 20 minutes, I had to run to the bathroom and you had to drink all this stuff. And when you sit down, you just say, thank God for gravity and everything just comes right out. I mean, it's, it's that whole thing. So I was, I'm young and I could do all that. But you got to keep in mind, too, you know, someone who's, let's say, 72 years old that needs to get this done. I mean, we understand it has to be done, but you got to think of the person doing the prep. Are they going to be able to, are they have arthritis that's going to be so bad that they can't run to the bathroom? you got to think in that way. You know, that you don't think, those things you don't think about. All right? So it's more the prep that, that I think is more of an issue than the actual procedure itself. The procedure is not bad at all. You know, you can't you have to be MPO, you can't eat anything the day before. Um, that's minor, but the toilet bowl thing, you know, I'm like, when is this going to stop kind of thing? It just keeps on coming, all right? Um, but the, the, I'm saying that because I don't want people to be afraid of a tube that's going through the back end. It's not anything enjoyable, it's just the thought of it, but it's not as bad as the prep, okay? Just give me a heads up. Okay, and it's doing that kind of thing. That's more like a sigmoid oscillator. Oh, no, it's going actually to the... Uh, Hold on.
And like I said, there's usually tools at the end, instruments at the end, that they can do things to. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Just want to go over just a few things. Um, medical surgical procedures. It, this is definitely stuff you're going to see as a nurse. There's no question about it. So I just want to introduce well, what's going on. You just see the end of the outside of it, but I want you to see what goes on the inside so you have an idea what's going on. This you're going to see quite often. A nasal gastric tube, all right? An NG tube. This is for somebody who, for some reason, can't get food into the stomach. Okay, whether they have problems swallowing, something is going on. So they will put a tube that goes into the nasal cavity, down the pharynx, into the stomach. Okay, and that's what that is. You're going to see that quite often. Who has seen that in real life, not on TV? Yeah, I mean, you see it. You see it quite often, right? You get feedings that way, too. Okay? Um, then we have surgical procedures. A gastrostomy um, is basically you're going to insert a tube, make a hole in the abdomen, and you're going to put a tube that goes from the, your outside uh, wall into the stomach itself. And we call that pu uh, percutaneous endoscopic um, gastrostomy. Uh, PEG is what we say. So we call it a PEG tube. And this is a more permanent thing. This should, um, the NG tube, you can only leave in for about a couple of weeks. Um, it gets a little irritating in the back of the throat. You can't really, I mean, you can't cough, but it gets irritating. This is more of a permanent thing. And what it actually is, is that you put this tube in, there's, it's basically the skin and part of the uh, stomach kind of gets sandwiched in between them. And you have this permanent tube that kind of stays there. Okay? Now that could, that could be permanent. You could leave that in there for years and years, you know, years and decades, or we could remove it, but that's more permanent. But you could put stuff in here. So in other words, if the person has problems swallowing, you know, we're afraid that it's going to go down the trachea, that the food is good, then you've got to do something like this. They've got to get nutri nutrients. But also, we could take Tylenol, if they need Tylenol, you crush it up, mix it with water, and you could push it right through here. Okay? You'll be doing this quite often, right? I mean, you'll be pushing a lot of stuff in there. You're going to see a lot of this stuff. So at least you have an idea of what's going on inside. Okay? Colostomy is basically if we're going to have the removed part of the colon because of cancer or other reasons, right? Inflammatory bowel disease. And then they're going to have a bag that's going to be sitting over here. So let me show what that is. All right? If we do that to the colon, we call it colostomy. If we do it to the small intestines, then it's ileostomy. Same thing. All right? What you're doing is, if this is your colon over here, we're, and this is where the problem lies in the sigmoid colon, we're going to remove that section. This is a dummy area. It does nothing. But then we're going to put a bag over here so that all the food is going to go into the bag. Okay? That's a colostomy. People are walking around, you don't even realize it. You would think that it stinks. It doesn't stink at all. It's because they've gotten better with this adhesive that goes right around here. But they've got to change it. it. depends on what they're eating, but they've got to change it maybe every eight hours or so. But they can eat normally. Sure. All right? And you'll be changing that when you deal with that, you know, in the hospital. So I just want, you're going to see that, but I want you to see what goes on inside so you have an idea of what to expect, okay? And endoscopy, we've been talking about endoscopy, so what is that all about? We just put a scope in there, and then like I said, a lot of times there's some instruments at the other end, and we can do things. We can add water there, we get to clean up the area, we can cauterize things, we can cut things, we can do a lot of things with that. So you have this scope that goes in, you could do it through the mouth, or as you've seen, you could do it through the back end. And like I said, there could be ends, or there's lights, of course, but there could be biopsy devices, there could be a cauterization, there could be blowing in air so you could uh, make, make it more distended so you could see more in the area. So that's what that is. Okay?